webinar. I'm Ann Mole, Webinar Coordinator for the Child Life Council. Please note that all attendees on today's webinar are muted. If you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into the question box on the GoToWebinar control panel as you think of them. We will collect them as we go along and will save time for our presenters to address them at the end of the webinar. As you watch today's presentation, please remember that you will be expected to present this material to your coworkers, both child life specialists and members of your multidisciplinary teams, and submit evidence of the training that you've held in order to receive your PDHs. You will have access to the slides that you will see today, as well as each presenter's notes to use in your presentation. Please take additional notes, as these will help you with your presentation. At the end of today's webinar, we'll discuss this process a bit further. We are very proud to present today's webinar, Effectively Using Pain Management and Palliative Care in Children's Cancer Treatment, Techniques to Address Treatment Anxiety, Introduce Pain Management, and Incorporate Alternative Methods of Pain Management. Shelby Hammond from Cure Search for Children's Cancer will introduce our speakers. Shelby, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having us. And thank you all for joining us in the last of our Child Life Specialist webinar series. Today, uh, our presenters will talk about techniques to address treatment anxiety, how to introduce pain management, and how to incorporate methods for pain management. Presenters will also discuss distraction techniques for managing pain, the psychological responses in the body that cause pain, how to approach procedure anxiety, how to talk with patients about pain management and palliative care, and how alternative methods of pain management can be incorporated into a treatment plan. Today we will hear from Jason Kanner, DO from Advocate Children's Hospital, Kendra Fredericks, Child Life Specialist from Yale New Haven Hospital, OJ Soller, MD from University of Rochester Medical Center, and Rosemary Obi, Music Therapist at University of Rochester Medical Center. First, we'll hear from Jason Kanner. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us um, once again for um, our webinars. And um, today we'd like to spend some time talking about pain management and palliative care. Um, my role specifically is to um, uh, define palliative care for, for all of you, um, to differentiate palliative care um, and hospice, um, and to discuss that a little bit. Um, talk a little bit about palliative care uh, within the pediatric uh, population and cancer uh, field and discuss uh, when pediatric palliative care is appropriate. So as a lot of us are aware, uh, palliative care comes with a lot of myths and um, inaccurate statements that makes uh, it, it more difficult to um, bring to our patients and to our hospitals. Um, I just wanted to discuss a couple of these and um, hopefully an end um, the myths or untruths about them. Uh, one thing is that, uh, that often people believe that palliative care needs to be related or is um, only for kids who are terminally ill or at the end of life. And as um, we're trying to teach you today regarding this, uh, palliative care is uh, very important for everyday life in children who have life-threatening illnesses and at each of your hospitals it may be defined a little differently, but does not need to uh, be related directly to uh, the terminally ill or end-of-life patient. Um, it is not equal to hospice. Um, personally, and, and I think you'll see in a slide upcoming, hospice really is part of palliative care, hopefully not uh, a part that um, patients don't get to, but if they do, it is incorporated within the palliative care program and team. And what it doesn't mean, uh, or what it does not mean when we consult the palliative care team is that we are giving up hope. Uh, rather, we are recognizing the importance of uh, life and uh, care despite the illness and that we want to be part of the team, as we'll talk about more. A child does not have to have any kind of DNR um, in place to have palliative care. And something that I think 
we often deal with uh, in hospital settings and even um, some of the uh, great organizations across the country deal with is that um, like something like Make-A-Wish, uh, palliative care is not only for children with cancer, nor is Make-A-Wish or other great organizations. Uh, it's for um, kids who, again, have life-threatening illnesses in all arenas. Um, because, again, it's about everyday life and ongoing care for the patient um, while this is going, the patient, the siblings, and the family while this is going on. Within the pediatric realm, palliative care does not mean that we're going to stop directed therapy or treatment. Um, and it, again, doesn't mean that we are giving up hope on a curative outcome. The primary team still plays a very large role and is, continues to be the primary team. It does uh, palliative care getting involved uh, is just asking another a great group of people to, to be a part of uh, things. Um, we, uh, palliative care does not mean that a patient needs to move to a different location or tr be treated with different patients or be in a different unit. Children and families are still able to stay in the places that they are comfortable or in the locations that they are comfortable. Um, and, and I think that especially from parents um, and other caretakers um, misunderstanding of, of palliative care. This does not mean that a child uh, is closer to death or will die sooner. Um, we work with patients from the start to learn uh, about the families, about the siblings, and about the patient um, to be able to approach them throughout care and if we get to end of life to know what they want. Um, all families do not want to be at home. All families do not want to be in the hospital if we get to end of life. And so palliative care uh, understands that and continues to work with the family no matter what environment they are in. Um, and one of the things with palliative care and then the end of life hospice part is that um, certain medicines that we use for comfort care uh, do not lead to uh, a quickened death. Um, and it's important because our goal is to be to take care of the patient, and we don't want to um, avoid that um, for a myth such as this. So the World Health Organization in 2010 um, has this definition, and it reads that palliative care is an approach that improves the quality of life of patients and their families facing the problem associated with life-threatening illness through the prevention and relief of suffering by means of early identification and impeccable assessment and treatment of pain and other problems, physical, psychosocial, and spiritual. Um, so hopefully that is something that you can refer to and teach um, throughout your institutions uh, and learn from. So when we talk about palliative care versus hospice, I've already mentioned that hospice uh, is really becomes a part of palliative care if needed. Palliative care is something that is um, in place for life-threatening illnesses, illnesses that still can be curative, and illnesses that we still are attempting to either cure or extend life and and use interventions for that for those goals. Hospice is often um, discussed um, when when end of life or death is within um, six months, uh, potentially, um, it is discussed uh, often, or it is something that we use for comfort care and to control pain, which we'll talk about later throughout this webinar, and to be there to support families, siblings, and patients through the later phases of illness and dying. One of the things that is so important about palliative care is that if we incorporate hospice into it, the palliative care team, or when we incorporate hospice into it, the palliative care team is now well known by the patient, the siblings, and the family, and therefore if we ever get to end of life, it is not, um, at least one of the shocks of meeting new people is not there because the palliative care team uh, is trained and can be used to deal with some of these end of life or hospice care. So within children, um, or the, the pediatric setting, 
palliative care um, for children is the active total care of the child's body, mind, and spirit, and also involves giving support to the family. Um, it is important that palliative care members are part of the team so they can address some of these other things that physicians, nurse practitioners, nurses, child life may not be able to do. Um, and, and, I th and hopefully we all recognize that, that each one of us on the team can um, influence each one of these things, body, mind, and spirit. Um, it, from, from the World Health Organization perspective as well as mine, this is a, something that should begin when illness is diagnosed and continue regardless of a ch child receiving treatment or not. Um, overall, uh, palliative care, uh, the use of palliative care could be, you know, multiple times in a week or a month for one patient and less times for another, but still the importance of introducing the team to the family is important. And as we know from many things in medicine, um, palliative care requires a multidisciplinary approach, which also includes the family and family members and caretakers, and makes the best use of the community. Um, one thing that we want to, or that I want to stress, is that palliative care can be successfully implemented even if our if resources are limited. I mentioned Make a Wish before. Um, all of you as child life specialists, and more people are palliative care whether you think so or not. Make a Wish is something that is used as part of treatment. It allows a family to get away from me medicine, uh, true medicine and doctors potentially, or to do things at home or throughout their community. Um, child life is similar. And so all of these things, whether we think of them before as palliative care, truly are that, and they contribute to life care. So even in situations where our resources or money are limited, things that you do as a team, as a child life team, or social workers do, or other nonprofits do, can be used very effectively as palliative care. So if we just touch on this slide for a moment and we look at the needs overall, we know that there's um, way too many uh, childhood deaths in the United States, um, but the majority of them uh, are made up in, within the neonatal units or the neonatal population and infants. Um, and then um, we have uh, a little less than 50% uh, between 1 and 19 years. Um, and about a quarter of those are due to children with complex chronic diseases, if you notice the top uh, triangle. What, this, what, I'm, what I'm trying to demonstrate here is really how important this, this field is. There are many, many children from birth to 19 that can be affected by chronic illness and then eventually uh, death. And therefore, uh, the, the world of palliative care uh, plays and should play a huge role. It's also to note that because there's so many neonates and infants, uh, that there is a role for palliative care in, that, uh, in those units and in that age group, uh, especially when it comes to family and caretakers and comfort care. Um, there's approximately a million kids uh, in the United States with complex chronic conditions and also would benefit greatly from um, this, this, this group of people and this type of work. So I think that this really um, defines things nicely and it's just a nice schema to look at. Um, I think there was a point in time where um, that it w where we looked at care that would try to prolong life and then at the end uh, a group of people or someone would possibly jump in and deal with end-of-life care. Now as we talked about in, uh, and shown nicely in this schema, um, we have disease-directed care that goes along simultaneously with palliative care and if we need to we get into hospice care. Another thing that's really important to think about throughout this is that point or that time after death, if it should occur, um, of bereavement. And 
just to touch on this um, base, um, I, I think I've said many things, but just to touch on this, there's two things. There's the philosophy of supportive and, and life care during chronic illness, um, supporting and caring for families during life-threatening illness, um, a philosophy of concentrating on uh, the quality of life, whether it's during illness or um, end of life. Um, but then there's the goals. And the goals are that we really want to try and um, encourage multidisciplinary teams encourage and, and, and achieve that, encourage um, the palliative care team to act often as a um, as a uh, go-between between, between um, some of the true medical medicine decisions, the rest of the hospital team or clinic team, and then life at home. Um, and we'd like, and the goal, as I mentioned before, was to introduce palliative care early in the course of illness um, and then to be available to recognize subtle shifts that occur throughout therapy um, that can be helpful to both the patient, family, and full multidisciplinary team. Um, it's important and to bring that all together with frequent reassessments of what's going on, where the child stands, where the family stands, and where um, the curative versus eventual outcome stands. All right, so um, I will um, touch on a couple things that are, are new in this slide, although it's, um, again, some stuff is um, just spoken in a different way, um, but this occurs with curative care. We, palliative care is a multidisciplinary unit of care that includes the child and family, and I cannot stress that enough. Um, and we need to look at all aspects of the care, not just medicine, treatment, body scans, et cetera. Some of the main focuses that, are, that palliative care concentrates on are going to be discussed in great detail um, by my colleagues coming up, is that the main focus of palliative care needs to be um, pain and symptom management. Um, a, um, resource that can concentrate and assure that there's good information sharing amongst the multidisciplinary team and the family. It's important to discuss advanced care planning prior to uh, the 11th hour and put those things in place even if they um, may never need to be used. Um, but we want to try to maintain some practical support um, using or, or making sure that we incorporate what goes on at home psychosocially and spiritually. And then, uh, as I mentioned, really coordination or, of care through like a navigator approach so the palliative care team can almost pull the shoestrings together to allow the family to be more comfortable. So when is palliative care appropriate? We like to think of palliative care in complex illnesses that may be causing fragmenta fragmentation of care or may require multiple disciplines to um, work with and treat the child, thus leading to poor communication. So in these complex illness times, uh, the palliative care team can hopefully come together and, and pull, um, again, pull, every, pull, pull the team tight and make the family feel like they are part of the team. Also, we think that palliative care should be incorporated and patients would benefit when there is a significant amount of pain and symptom, man symptom management where, where the group of doctors, nurse practitioners, nurses, etc., that are experts in pain are brought on and often those are the palliative care, that is the palliative care team. As mentioned, when we have a child that does have a life or a terminal illness or a short life expectancy, it's important to incorporate this team from the beginning. 
when we run into a situation where the usual treatment methods or protocols are no longer effective or becoming increasingly burdensome. So we may have a child who uh, was initially diagnosed with a somewhat curative illness, um, such as, you know, luckily we can put most leukemias in that right now. However, now we're in a relapse situation or in a situation where we are off protocol or we are creating new treatment plans and went from maybe an outpatient setting to an inpatient setting because of um, recurrence. And now life has really changed even more than it already did. So now families are used to the new normal by their diagnosis of leukemia, but now once again we've thrown a um, uh, or medicine has thrown something at them where uh, things have become more burdensome. And as I mentioned, hospital stays may become more frequent than they were at first. Um, it's also important for the team and palliative care team uh, often can be um, the individuals that recognize this, but when a declining condition, um, whether it's mentally or physically, becomes more evident and or um, based on the last couple of things I said, where the family and child would benefit from an increased home-based support service. So when it really is more appropriate for um, the child to be home and not in the hospital as much. I think just, um, I think that uh, again the, the rest of my colleagues are going to do a great job um, discussing pain and, and other things uh, throughout this webinar. But to lead into that, we want to talk about when, how do we, are, how we introduce palliative care or even pain control. I think it's important to try to avoid asking whether palliative care should be part of the um, part of things or not. I think that it's great um, for uh, institutions to start to think as palliative care as part of the team from the beginning. You, you see child life. You see psychology, you see the doctors, and you see palliative care, and there's many more. Um, with that being said, as, as just mentioned, I think it's important to introduce in a diagnosis. We don't want families to feel like uh, we we don't want families to feel like a palliative care team is coming in at the end, because number one, uh, the patient and the family feels more uncomfortable, especially in a trying time, and number two, it contributes to the myths of palliative care. If they are part of the team from the beginning and part of the care team from the beginning, then I think more and more people will understand that it's not always about end of life and it's about quality of life. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the webinar. Hello, I'm O.J. Saylor. I'm a behavioral pediatrician at the Golisano Children's Hospital at the University of Rochester Medical Center in Rochester, New York. I'm the director of our Pediatric Psychosocial Oncology Program and a member of the Pediatric Palliative Care, or as we name it, Supportive Care team. I work with patients with both acute and chronic pain and other noxious symptoms such as nausea and vomiting, very common problems among cancer patients. My task today is to discuss why distraction as a form of symptom management works, or in other words, to help us all understand better why the comment often made to people who experience pain, it's all in your head, is actually true, but definitely not in the derogatory way it is sometimes said to mean that you don't have any real, quote unquote, pain. As Jason Kanner reminded us, palliative care is any form of care or treatment designed to reduce the severity of disease symptoms rather than to strive to cure or halt disease progression. I'm going to focus my comments on the perception of unpleasant feelings, in particular pain. I've chosen pain because we know a lot about how pain sensation is transmitted to the brain and how therapies, other than medicines, can help to control pain. In particular, I'm going to talk about the broad topic of distraction. How we use a variety of techniques to provide effective trans, uh, distraction will be the heart of this webinar. However, first, 
I will review the scientific basis for why distraction is such a good non-pharmacologic approach. Hopefully, this information will be useful to you in explaining the physiologic rationale for using distraction to patients and families. So, why was Grandma right when she said, just take your mind off your pain? What is pain? Pain is an unpleasant feeling, a sensory or emotional experience, often caused by intense or damaging stimuli, such as stubbing a toe, burning a finger, or putting alcohol on a cut. What does a person do in response to pain? Well, three things come immediately to mind. Pain motivates the individual to withdraw from damaging stimuli or situations, protect a damaged body part while it heals, and avoid similar experiences in the future. No wonder a child might not want to come to the clinic. Most pain resolves promptly once the painful stimulus is removed and the body has healed. But sometimes pain persists despite apparent healing. And sometimes pain arises in the absence of any detectable stimulus, damage, or disease, such as the phantom limb type pain that we sometimes see in children who have had an amputation. Remember that physical pain arises in response to or even in anticipation of a painful event, such as the pain that a child experiences as an injection is given and the anticipatory anxiety the child experiences, knowing the pain will come when the child sees a needle. The same physiologic and psychologic process of anxiety is at work when a child who has back pain that is, let's say, a 2 out of 10, that then increases to a 3 out of 10, knows that it usually reaches a 10 out of 10 in half an hour. Becoming anxious about the impending pain instead of relaxing and getting ahead or in control of the pain sensation can actually become a self-fulfilling prophecy. What is anxiety? So it is important to realize that anxiety in anticipation of pain plays a large role in how pain is perceived and can actually increase the pain experience. To define it, anxiety is an unpleasant state of inner turmoil, often accompanied by nervous or clinging behavior in response to a perceived threat. The physical changes that the person experiences can include palpitations, tachycardia, hyperventilation, muscle tension, headache, or stomach ache. These are all the results of the body's reaction to the stress response a very primitive sympathetic nervous system activation response. The stress response leads to increases in blood flow to the vital organs. The brain, the most vital organ, the heart to pump blood effectively where it is needed, the lungs to increase oxygen availability, and the major muscle groups, the muscles of the upper arms for fight, and the muscles of the thighs for flight. At the same time, immune and digestive functions are inhibited because they are not considered vital in the acute phase of the stress response. External signs of anxiety may include pallor, sweating, and trembling. Usually, anxiety is considered an overreaction to a situation. Although, when we think about the procedures that children with cancer have to undergo, such as bone marrow aspiration, I'm not sure everyone would call their anxiety out of proportion to what they understand. For example, older children and adults can understand why a test like a bone marrow is necessary and tolerate the pain because of the benefit. Younger children understand only the immediacy of the threat. They are indeed anxious, but they are also experiencing real fear. Thus, an important principle in understanding the pain experience is that reducing the sense of anxiety or stress that often accompanies pain or accompanies the anticipation of pain is critical to reducing pain. An explanation for why the test is needed can be helpful for some children. More often, distraction will be the key to making their experience less painful and frightening. 
to explain why distraction works, I'm going to use the gate theory of pain transmission. In its simplest form, the gate theory says that there is only so much information that the brain can process at one time. In this slide, we see that noxious information is carried by the red nerve fibers. And distractive information is carried by the green fibers. All of this information is traveling to the sensory gate into the brain. In this basic schematic, more of the information carried by the green or distractive fibers is getting through to the cerebral cortex. Why might this be true? The answer is that sensory nerve fibers carry information to the brain at different rates. In this more detailed slide are listed C and three kinds of A fibers. C fibers carry information about sharp pain. The diameter of C fibers is relatively small, 0.2 to 1.5 micrometers, compared to the other fibers. Sensation travels along these C fibers at an average rate of one meter per second, or about two miles per hour, or at the rate of a leisurely walk. Let's say you touch a hot pan. Since it's not very far from the tip of your finger to your brain, you feel this sensation very fast, after a second or two. Next are the A delta fibers, which transmit sensations like pressure and cold. They are almost 10 times as large in diameter as the C fibers and carry information at the rate of about 60 miles per hour or the speed of a car on the highway. This helps to explain why if you get an injection, you are likely to press on the injection site or want to put on a cold compress. Pressure and cold sensations travel to the brain faster than a stinging or injection sensation. Over millennia, we as humans have become able to tolerate cold and pressure more easily than we can tolerate sharp pain. So instinctively, we substitute a less painful sensation for a more painful one. A beta fibers are even larger and carry information such as touch. Sensation travels along these fibers at about 100 miles per hour or getting close to the speed of a race car. A alpha fibers, which can be as much as 100 times the diameter of a C fiber, carry information that makes you aware of your body, that you're sitting, and that your legs are crossed, and about the world around you, such as music is being played, someone is talking to you, you're blowing bubbles. These fibers transmit information at the rate an airplane is traveling at takeoff or about 200 miles per hour, or 100 times the rate at which your brain gets the information that you have just started getting an injection. Thus, if you are talking with someone about something interesting, the information that will get to your brain will be about the conversation and not about the fact that you just got a shot. You might feel that while well, it's happening, that all the anticipatory anxiety and the fear will have been avoided and as soon as you get the sharp stick in your arm, you'll rub it, pressure feeling, or mom will blow on it, cool feeling, and the sensation of pain will be lessened. Now we know why mom's kisses make the hurt better. What is distraction? One definition is that it's something that diverts attention and makes it hard to think or do work. For example, I can't do my homework with so many distractions like people talking or having the TV on. Another definition is that it's something that amuses or entertains and makes it hard to think about problems, such as pain. How does distraction work to relieve pain? To a large extent, we've already answered this question. In this slide, focus on the S for small fibers or slow fibers and the L for large fibers, or laugh fibers. We see a P, which is the actual perception that is going through the gate to the brain. In this schematic, almost all sensation is coming from the L, large, or laugh fiber. 
stimulus that is making the small fibers fire is still there. A critical thing to remember. But the sensation is only partially getting through. Now, sometimes a child will be admitted because of 10 out of 10 pain, and then several minutes later will be engrossed by a video, and staff will wonder if the child really has pain at all. However, if the child is busy doing something that is entertaining, distracting or diverting attention, and looks fine, and someone comes into the room and says, how is your pain? The child will likely stop for a moment and say, it really hurts. We now know why this is so. If the child can be distracted so that almost all perception of fibers are focused on the video game, there's little space for the brain fibers to get through and for the brain to register the pain. Stop the distraction by calling the child's attention to his or her pain. And the child will feel the pain that is still there and being transmitted by C and A delta fibers, but that was blocked by the overwhelming sensory input transmitted by the A alpha fibers. Until that is, someone asks the child to focus on the pain. Suddenly, only the information from the pain fibers is getting through to the brain, and the child hurts. Everyone will be incapacitated by pain in the 8 to 10 out of 10 range. A few will truly push themselves to function, but probably not well, even with pain in the 6 to 8 range. Many will say they do not feel well, but will do what they must in the 4 to 6 range. Just about everybody will function at a decent level, even if not at their best, with pain in the 1 to 3 range. The goal of pain management, then, is to reduce the severity of pain to the point that the patient can manage pretty well. And even if not at his or her best, at least not at the level where pain significantly impairs functioning. So distraction typically works by decreasing the intensity of pain perception. The goal is to get the pain to one. I never promise zero. Sometimes patients, adults as well as children, are embarrassed to say that they can take their mind off their pain, as Grandma recommended at the beginning of my talk, because this somehow makes their pain experience less real. I tell them that they should be very proud of themselves, that they have learned how to use their body's own healing and pain control mechanisms to help them feel better, rather than always having to rely on medicines. And the wonderful thing about doing it yourself is that you don't have to carry medication with you all the time or feel helpless if your prescription runs out. Instead, you are your own medicine. A 15-year-old girl with severe headaches told me that once she understood how painful stimuli are transmitted and perceived by the brain and how she could control that perception, she had developed a different understanding of the comment, it's all in your head, that she sometimes got from medical providers. She said to me, you know, they say it as if I were faking my pain. But I've learned that their comment is actually true, but just not in the way they meant it. It is all in my head, and I now know how to control it. This has taken a lot of the fear of uncontrollable pain away. I know that I can keep the pain at a 4 or 5 or even a 6 rather than let it get to a 9 or 10 by deep breathing, using my imagination, or getting involved with one of my hobbies. My whole body relaxes. Being able to be distracted by someone or something is good medicine. Being able to distract yourself is the best medicine. Kendra, a child life worker, and Rosie, a music therapist, will now give us a lot of suggestions about how best to provide distraction to our patients. So now that Dr. Saylor has taken us through why distraction works, uh, we want to talk a little bit about distraction techniques for managing pain. Uh, as Dr. Saylor said, I'm Kendra. I am a child life specialist in hematology oncology at Yale New Haven Children's Hospital. 
And I'm Rosie Obi, and I am the music therapist at Galasano Children's Hospital at the University of Rochester Medical Center. I work as part of the pediatric hematology oncology team here, and also work very closely with our excellent child life department. Kendra and I will be discussing non-pharmacological approaches to managing pain. Specifically, we will discuss ways to alter patients' thinking and their focus in order to decrease pain without the use of medication. Non-pharmacological methods can include behavioral, cognitive, complementary, and physical strategies. We want to talk a little bit more about each of these strategies and how to utilize them in conjunction with pharmacological methods. Research shows that the combination of both farm and non-farm will help to achieve the best pain reduction outcomes. I don't want to spend too much time on this slide as much of it is at the heart of what we do in child life, but for the purposes of you taking this presentation to your multidisciplinary team, uh, it's worth noting because not everybody you present this information to is going to have experience in these areas. Preparation and desensitization utilizes materials such as books, dolls, dialogue, medical equipment, and medical play kits to assist the child and family in better understanding their hospital experience. The goal of preparation is to reduce anxiety and to that end reduces pain and pain perception. Preparation also provides the opportunity to rehearse and gain mastery over situations, thus providing children the opportunity to focus on the procedural support and distraction as they know what to expect from the procedural standpoint. Preparation should include coaching with medical staff and parents to ensure that the patient is receiving a consistent message, that phrasing is chosen carefully, ensures parental presence whenever possible, and engages everyone as part of the team. During procedural support and distraction, the role of the child life specialist might include advocating for pain reduction measures such as Sweeties, Elemax, Buzzy, and positions of comfort. Distraction with toys, music and or technology, opportunities for deep breathing, giving choice and control whenever possible, and advocating for parental presence, all of which will ensure a more personalized experience for that patient. It is also important for specialists to coach and model for patients in pain. Pediatric patients often need help in learning how to report their pain. Child life specialists can help patients find the words to describe their pain, as well as better understand pain skills. For example, you may help a patient create a personalized pain scale that illustrates behaviors alongside the pain number they're asked to report. You may ask the child, what does it look like when your pain is at a one? And the child might say, I'm at home, going to school, active, and playing with friends. When their pain is at a five, they may be taking medication and thinking about coming to the hospital. When at a seven, they might be at the hospital, taking medication, but able to play video games or go to the playroom. When at a 10, they may report that they're in bed taking pain medication, that it's hard to think about anything other than pain, and they might seem angry or not want to be bothered. This quick intervention can help everyone involved in the patient's care, as every patient might report their pain score differently. Moving on to some cognitive strategies, there are many different outlets that can be used to decrease pain. Spot pressure or counter irritation allows the patient to direct the sensation of their pain elsewhere. I recently had a patient with osteosarcoma that experienced the amputation of his right leg. Because of this, he suffered frequently from phantom limb pain. He found success in using a pinpoint impression toy. There's a picture of one on the top right of this slide. Similar to this, patients might enjoy rhythmic rocking, vibration, or a tapping routine when experiencing pain. Breathing exercises are a powerful method for calming the mind and the body. These exercises could include blowing bubbles or a pinwheel, breathing deeply, asking the patient to follow your lead while breathing, or a guided deep breathing session. Examples of these sessions can be found on YouTube, iTunes, or on CDs. Child life specialists daily provide cognitive mental distraction that to others may appear as simple as just giving the patient something to do because they're bored. However, we know that technology, such as video games and movies, 
art, and group play, reading, music, and movement are all effective ways at reducing pain and creating a more positive medical experience. Additional ways that we can help patients are through positive reinforcement, coping self-statements, and thought stopping. Simply recognizing and praising patients' efforts can help them to feel accomplished. Avoid simply saying, good job, but rather point out what they are doing that is impressive, such as, you were able to walk five more steps than yesterday. You should feel very proud. Choose your wording carefully. I can remember a time we endlessly worked with a patient who was hesitant to get out of bed because she was afraid it would worsen her pain. She responded well to a schedule where she would walk three times a day and in doing so earn a small prize. As she walked in the hallway, a member of the medical staff said, great, you're up, you must feel better. His attempt was genuine, but the patient internalized that as his not believing she was in real pain, and it made subsequent attempts for her to walk more difficult. In a conversation following, she stated that she worried they may decrease her medicine or send her home too early. Over the years, I've had countless patients, as I'm sure you have, express to me that they don't feel heard or nobody takes the time to listen. You might help the patient create an affirmation poster, like the one on the bottom right of this slide. The patient can cut and collage pictures and words that are meaningful to them and refer to it when experiencing discomfort. This might also help the staff get to know someone on a more intimate level. You could also decorate the patient's room with quotes, passages, and pictures. If the patient prefers a more private outlet, journaling and writing are not only great ways to divert from pain, but also to document a journey. Fostering ongoing creative outlets for patients can allow them to express how they're feeling with or without using words. Activities such as coloring pain, painting to various types of music, or creating a pain monster with open-ended art materials don't require any verbal communication. Pain monsters can be really fun because there are websites such as kidsworld.com that will take the child's drawing and turn it into a stuffed animal. Then this stuffed animal can be used to vent frustrations or sleep when in pain. If the patient is expressive, you could create pain masks where the patient displays their outer self that the world sees on the front and express their inner, more private self on the back. You might also construct a worry can where the patient can write or draw their worries on paper, place it in the can or jar, and leave it aside for another time. Anger outlets and energy release activities such as a bozo bop bag, punching bag, stress balls, pounding clay or play-doh, and a hammering wood project are great for children of many ages. Laughter is also a wonderful release, so tasks like writing Mad Libs, having a visit from hospital clowns, watching a comedy stick, skit, or breaking out in a silly dance can make all the difference in someone's recollection of their pain. There is something to the phrase, time flies when you're having fun. Involving friends, family, and other companions helps to take their mind off the pain. They know their child best and can often provide activity ideas and are a safe person for the patient to talk to about their feelings. They also can be a huge help in helping their child begin to see the hospital staff as helpers. Be sure that you always encourage family members to take care of themselves as that will ensure they can take the best care of their child. Another method used by many in child life is guided imagery. The mental image of sights, sounds, tastes, smells, and feelings can often help shift attention away from pain and take the patient on a journey. This intervention takes practice but a great resource to get started is the book Healing Images for Children with Cancer by Nancy Klein. This is also something the patient can do on their own as there are many apps and videos on YouTube to take patients through this process. Lastly, some facilities, my own included, offer hypnosis. The goal of hypnosis is an altered state of consciousness to focus and narrow attention and reduce discomfort. During hypnosis, the mind is more open to suggestion and patients can learn to change their thoughts, feelings, behavior, and attitudes. Before I move to the next slide, I would encourage everyone who hasn't seen it yet to refer to the new Child Life App Directory on the Child Life Council website for suggestions of apps to use with children during procedures and with pain management. Therapeutic play is again at the heart of child life. 
Play enables children to learn, be in control, and explore emotions. Many play activities can be adapted for children of different age groups, such as exploring feelings. For an older toddler, you might write simple feelings, like happy or sad, on a card and hide the cards around the patient room or playroom. When the patient finds the card, you can ask them to tell you about a time they felt that way. For a school-age child, you could do this with a game of pick-up sticks. Associate the colors of the sticks to a feeling, and as they successfully remove one from the pile, they can tell you about a time they felt that color or feeling. For adolescents, you might play Feeling Scrabble or Jenga. Always remember that play is the best assessment tool for any child life specialist. I'm going to move on to talk about some complementary strategies that might require additional education or training, such as meditation. Meditation is widely practiced with the goal of restoring calm and inner peace and focusing the mind. There are many different kinds of meditation, such as mantra, mindfulness, transcendental meditation, and Tai Chi. A nice way to begin exploring this option for your patients are the books Moonbeam and Earthlight, which are meditation books for children by Maureen Garth. You can also find many wonderful apps for meditation, and this, as with guided imagery, is something the patient can do on their own when a child life specialist isn't available or the patient is at home. The practice of Reiki aims at providing stress reduction and relaxation. It is administered by the laying on of hands and the idea of an unseen life force energy. During a Reiki session, muscles are relaxed and then the energy flow is unblocked. This helps reduce physical tension and pain. Anxiety and stress are also reduced, helping to unblock and release emotional pain. Although the patient may not be completely pain-free, they feel relaxed, refreshed, and better able to cope with their condition. Aromatherapy are essential oils that, when inhaled, stimulate brain function and promote well-being. They can be provided in a room spray, sachet, or lotion. In other countries, aromatherapy is also often ingested. Different scents target a different response, such as vanilla is used to relax, peppermint, jasmine, and citrus aim at recharging, and green apple is said to provide relief. Moving back to the creative and expressive, we can consider therapeutic art and art therapy. I have the good fortune of being able to work with several artists as part of our Arts for Healing program at Yale New Haven Children's Hospital. In this slide, you can see two examples of this work. On the top photo, a patient created a digital photography piece with our art therapist. She was asked to photograph herself or something significant in the hospital environment. She then edited the photo purposely wanting to show her central line, and added the short but powerful testament, I smile to hide the pain. In the bottom photo, our department writer and rap artist helped a patient with leukemia create a poem about her experience in the hospital. This patient was asked to name a feeling she often felt while inpatient or in the clinic, and the poem was created from her feeling, worry. I'm told the image is a little hard to read, so I thought I'd take a minute to share it with you. Worry by Sam, age 16. Worry sounds like footsteps, a knock on the door. Worry sounds like my heartbeat screaming in my ears. Worry looks like the curtain being pulled back, changing the bag, unattaching the IV line. Worry feels like something I haven't felt yet, a pain I could feel. Worry can smell like Purell hands or latex gloves. Worry can taste like the familiar taste of saline. Worry is some kind of blue, a faded blue, a blue that's not quite there yet, almost clear. While both of these interactions with patients were one-on-one, -on -one, you can find some wonderful group activity ideas at expressivetherapist.com. For physical strategies, not all of these items will be initiated by our profession, but we can work with other disciplines like physical, occupational, and speech therapy to support their goals at bedside and in play areas. You can encourage exercise, movement, and stretching, such as going outdoors, taking a ball, yoga, using TheraBands, and positioning the patient in a way that is comfortable. You might also advocate for massage or infant massage, which has been shown to promote relaxation, alleviate the perception of pain, and reduce anxiety. Another method of pinpointing the muscles for relaxation 
is practicing progressive muscle relaxation. Progressive muscle relaxation is the practice of tensing and releasing the muscles moving from one end of the body to the other. You can find wonderful exercises for this on YouTube. Before we begin the next slide, it's important that I note that practicing reflexology, Reiki, massage, acupuncture, and hypnosis requires a certification or license. Many hospitals will require, for legal and liability reasons, that a parent consent form be signed or that the practitioner is a hospital employee. The efficacy of these pain reduction methods are also hard to measure, so please make sure to speak with your team about how to track and document the patient-reported response. On this slide, you will see various methods of neurostimulation that are used in pain management, including the TENS machine, biofeedback, acupuncture, acupressure, and reflexology. Please see the notes section for a brief description of each of these interventions. We encourage you to advocate for these options if they are available and approved for use at your institution. In my hospital, I utilize BioDots as a very basic form of biofeedback in conjunction with my music relaxation sessions. The BioDot is a small sticker that is placed on the back of a patient's hand and is similar to a mood ring, but much more reliable and based on the body's stress response that Dr. Saylor described earlier. They can be used as a self-help tool in which patients clinical and evidence-based use of music interventions to accomplish individualized goals within a therapeutic relationship by a credentialed professional who has completed an approved music therapy program. It is an established health service and consists of using music therapeutically to address physical, psychological, cognitive, and or social functioning for patients of all ages. A music therapist can have either a bachelor's, master's, or doctoral degree in music therapy. The curriculum includes coursework in music therapy, psychology, general music, biological, social, and behavioral sciences, disabilities, human development, and general studies. A music therapist must complete a 1,040-hour or six-month clinical internship before taking the national certification examination. Upon passing the exam, graduates are issued the credential necessary for professional practice, which is MTBC, or Music Therapist Board Certified. Any individual who does not have proper training and credentials is not qualified to provide music therapy services. Music has many functions that lend well to its use in both palliative care and pain management. It can create comfort and security, energize and motivate, serve as a masking agent, provide reinforcement, be used for alternate engagement, distraction, or as an active focus, and also provide structure. Some examples of music therapy interventions include active music making, including singing, playing instruments, music improvisation or songwriting, music and movement activities, lyric discussion, passive music listening, and music-assisted relaxation. The following principles can be utilized when working with pain management in music therapy. The concept of entrainment, which is the tendency of two bodies in motion to lock into phase, so that they move or vibrate in harmony, as well as the ISO principle, which involves matching music to the patient's current mood state and then changing the music to yield a different state, can be used independently or in combination with one another. The music therapist can synchronize music to the patient's physiologic pain responses, such as increased heart rate or respiratory rate, or to their behavioral or mood state, and then gradually shift the music to reflect a more relaxed state thus decreasing their physiologic responses or improving their mood through the use of entrainment. This can happen through music alone or the therapist can engage the patient in the process by asking them to play what their pain sounds like on musical instruments. The patient is then asked to play what no pain would sound like. Then the therapist and the patient would work together to slowly progress from making the pain sound 
to the no pain sound. This can help the patient to manipulate or have some control over the pain and also allows for mu emotional expression. Music can also be used with the gate theory of pain, which Dr. Saylor described in detail earlier. On the next slide, I will share a video example of this in action. When selecting music for use with patients, several considerations should be made. If you are fortunate to have a music therapist at your hospital, the benefits of live music include the ability of the therapist to immediately change the speed, song selection, lyrics, and or volume of the music to match the patient's current state. Recorded music is helpful in that it provides the opportunity for the patient to practice and or use their relaxation techniques at any time of day. Patient preference is considered to be the most important aspect of music selection. Music will be most effective if it is what the patient chooses and wants to hear. The patient's definition of relaxing music may be very different than your own, and it is important to acknowledge what works for them. A patient's developmental needs are also important in selecting music and interventions. You should consider how long the patient is able to remain focused and attentive to the music without the risk of overstimulating or desensitizing them to the point that the music is pushed to the background. Lastly, the type of music used can determine outcomes. Generally speaking, stimulative music is characterized as energizing, often because of its strong rhythmic component and dynamic volume changes. This type of music is more rhythmically and melodically complex and is best used for distraction or active engagement. In contrast, sedative music can be described as calming or soothing. Typically the rhythm is regular and even, the melody is smooth, and there are few changes in volume. In many cases, sedative music is best used for relaxation based on the patient's preference. Next, I'd like to share a video example that illustrates the gate theory of pain. In this video clip, music therapy is being used for procedural support during an injection procedure for a 16-year-old patient with cerebral palsy who functions cognitively around 12 years of age and is very anxious about the injections. At her previous visits, she was given Versed for sedation due to her high levels of anxiety. However, after her mother saw how well she responded to music therapy, she decided to not use Versed as long as the music therapist was present. In this video, the use of live music engagement effectively blocks the patient's perception of pain and also works to alleviate procedural anxiety without the use of medication as her attention is focused towards the therapist and in singing. You can see and hear the doctor in the background administering the two injections as well as her mother providing support at the bedside. The music therapist is standing to the patient's left out of view of the camera. At the end of the video, listen for the patient's response when she's asked if she felt anything.
Music therapists take a preventative approach when working with patients with cancer. It is important to work with the patient in the early stages of their treatment in order to build rapport and trust. The therapist works to identify and promote the use of coping strategies early on. Ideally, the therapist can help the patient to practice and refine their relaxation and coping strategies before they actually begin the pain of communication between the patient, their family, and their medical team, especially regarding the patient's medical experiences and needs. In music therapy, this can be done through the use of songwriting, lyric discussion, improvisation, and supportive conversation. For example, I worked with an 11-year-old girl who was afraid of needles and was able to articulate and work through her specific fears by writing a song simply called The Needle Blues. Lastly, music therapists aim to promote quality of life and wellness throughout all phases of treatment. We want to stress the importance of collaboration and communication between staff as it provides the best outcome for patients. It can also foster creative programming for patients such as recitals, relaxation programs, songwriting from journal prompts, and or co-treating a patient during a medical procedure. Both Rosie and I participate in psychosocial rounds where some of the discussion is focused on who's doing what in terms of pain management. It is important to delineate roles so as not to overwhelm the patient by presenting the same methods, such as Reiki, multiple times, but rather presenting multiple different pain management options. In a study conducted by Klassen in the t in, at all in 2008, it was found that music may actually be more effective when it is part of a multifaceted intervention aimed at distracting the patient from the painful or anxiety-provoking stimuli. To demonstrate the impact of following patients throughout the various stages of care, I'd like to share two case examples with you all. The first is an excerpt from a letter written by a patient's mother. Since I am the only music therapist at my hospital, I am able to follow our patients as they move between different units, including our oncology floor, PICU, bone marrow transplant unit, and sometimes our outpatient clinic when my schedule allows. The following letter describes the perceived impact of music therapy through the various phases of treatment, including initial diagnosis, inpatient treatment, and bone marrow transplant. My daughter's first experience with music was in the hospital as a patient with cancer with the hospital's music therapist. She was two and a half at the time and very sick. She could not leave her room due to infection and was a very shy child. The music therapist visited frequently and my daughter perked up and looked forward to her visits and making music. She grew from a shy child to a confident one and became able to join in the music groups that the music therapist led in the common areas. I believe that music therapy helped her open up enough to interact more with other staff members and other children as she started off as a terribly scared and sick child. On some of the days, especially during her bone marrow transplant, when she was too sick to participate, I would take her place, singing between the tears I cried for her and rocking her gently to the music that the music therapist played and sang for us. Music therapy is a very important part of my child's recovery. It has made her happy when she is sad smile when she is weak, and sit up when she is too tired or in pain. Lastly, I'd talk, like to talk a little bit about my experience in home-based services. I am fortunate enough to hold a per diem position with a company called CompassionNet, which is a pediatric palliative care program here in western New York that provides in-home services to patients diagnosed with life-threatening illnesses. This program follows a holistic approach, assigning each family with a case manager who assesses the needs of the entire family and connects them to valuable resources, including child life specialists, music, art, and massage therapists. Through my unique position, both in the hospital and with CompassionNet, I have seen firsthand the benefits of providing services in the home, as well as how continuity of care can extend from the hospital into the home. 
I'd like to share a case example that illustrates the role of music therapy throughout the entire course of treatment. I first met Ella when she was two years old during her first hospitalization for newly diagnosed stage four neuroblastoma. Ella was a spunky little girl with a creative imagination who would fully immerse herself in exploration of my musical instruments during our individual and group sessions, which she regularly, regularly participated in during her frequent hospital stays. She tended to go into her own little world with her instruments and also would wiggle her body to the beat of whatever song was playing. Music therapy goals during this phase included building trust, providing normalization of the hospital environment, encouraging expression of feelings, and the development of coping skills. When Ella was three, she had an autologous bone marrow transplant, during which she experienced increased pain from mucositis, which was the first time that I ever really saw her slow down while she was in the hospital. During visits in which she was experiencing pain, she would still participate in music therapy, playing her favorite instruments at a slightly more subdued pace and wiggling a little less along to the music. During these sessions, she would fatigue easily and I would utilize entrainment to help her fall asleep at times. Music therapy goals shifted based on how she presented each day and pain management became the focus of our, the majority of our sessions. Ella was in remission for a year after transplant, but unfortunately relapsed when she was five years old. She began going to another hospital for treatment as she participated in various clinical trials. About six months after her relapse, I was asked to see Ella at home through CompassionNet. Ella was very excited during our first visit at her house, especially when she saw that I had some of her favorite instruments with me. At our every other week home visits, Ella began to open up much more as she explored her musical identity, creativity, and the ability to express herself. The majority of our sessions were spent improvising songs based on Ella's play with the musical instruments I brought, especially my animal-shaped rhythm instruments. Ella would narrate activities that the animal instruments were engaging in, often with topics related to going to the hospital, getting poked, and feeling worried. Through creating songs, Ella was able to express her own thoughts about her hospital stays, her family, and to reflect on her life experiences. For two years, I was fortunate to work with Ella in her home, with occasional inpatient stays for medical complications. When she was seven, she began experiencing respiratory distress from multiple lung infections. During this time, our home visits shifted to focus on relaxation, comfort, and quality of life, especially during times when Ella was too fatigued to actively participate. Eventually, she was admitted to our PICU, where she was emergently intubated and sedated. The next day, a Friday, I was able to provide music at her bedside once, playing all of her favorite songs for her and her parents, who sang along when possible. I also provided her and her family with a CD of her favorite songs to play in the room, as well as a CD full of Ella's original songs that had been recorded at our home visits. Ella died two days later. Her family played several of her original songs during her funeral service. Her mother often sends me messages to thank me for the gift of these songs, as she has them on her iPod, and she smiles whenever one of them plays as she listens to her music on shuffle and waits for the special moments when Ella's songs say hello through her music. Thank you to all of our presenters for that valuable information. Um, some important takeaways from today's presentation are that palliative care is the active total care of the child's body, mind, and spirit, and also involves giving support to the family. There are many palliative care myths that a medical team must address. Pain can create different responses in people, but most can benefit from distraction techniques. Non-pharmacological approaches to managing pain can be effective in helping to decrease pain, and continuity of care requires interdisciplinary collaboration. And now, we'd like to take some questions. Um, first off, this one question is for Jason. Um, in a facility where a palliative care team is new, understaffed, or non-existent, do you have any suggestions for the psycho psychological care team members to advocate for more palliative approach with medical team for appropriate patients? Um, 
Well, you know, I, I think we, we were in a similar situation um, probably about a year ago, uh, and I think the most important thing is education. Uh, people need to under, I think the most important thing for everyone to understand is that palliative care does not change uh, the hope of the medical care team, the hope of the patient, et cetera. I think that's what a lot of um, people are fearful of. Secondly, I think they're fearful that the palliative care team may um, become too obtrusive or, or too controlling of the whole situation. And I think as long as that is stressed, as long as we teach our colleagues, and as long as we stress that we're, you know, we'd like to be part of the team and work as a team to take care of a family, um, then it leads to at least more success. With all that being said, I also think that the introduction of palliative care to a new program uh, is going to come with resistance. So I think it needs to be an understood um, thing, um, and and the people who are running it need to be um, continue to fight for uh, this this well, you know, this needed service. Uh, what we were successful doing in our institution um, with regards to funding it uh, was working actually honestly with found our foundation and donors because when it when when the foundation and donors are taught about the importance of it, um, we were lucky in finding that many of them uh, became supportive and and now we have a fund that um, is more than enough to help us get started and continue the program. Great. Uh, and this question kind of goes out to the group. Um, does anyone have any thoughts about supporting infants and their caregivers in a palliative care situation? Well, I'll, I'll get started on that. Are these um, infants, uh, in terms of um, young babies who are in the uh, intensive care unit? Uh, um, I'll, should I make that assumption? Or? Yeah. Okay, well, let me make that assumption for now. Um, certainly, there are a number of programs that are beginning to demonstrate the usefulness of music therapy uh, within the uh, neonatal intensive care unit um, uh, milieu. One of the problems that we face with very young and fragile uh, infants is that uh, uh, environmental sound uh, can be a, a major problem. And so if people are very aware of that and keep the music soothing and soft, I think that um, we, we need to do a lot of education with our neonatology friends uh, to let them or have them better understand the usefulness and perhaps the usefulness toward uh, brain development that music can provide uh, to um, to these very fragile infants. Uh, so there is work being done. Uh, I think there should be more. And uh, hopefully, as people become less um, or more aware of how important it is to keep uh, sounds low, uh, that music therapists will be invited into that medium more. Thanks, OJ. Um, this one, I believe, is for Kendra. Um, what is a bio dot, and how can you get them? Oh, that was uh, me, that Rosie, oh, that <laughs> talked about that. That's OK. Um, in the notes section of uh, the PowerPoint, which should be available um, online, there is a link to the website we purchased them from. But in case you can't see it, it is www.stressstop.com. And um, they are fairly inexpensive. It is literally a tiny circle of a sticker that goes on the back of a hand. Um, you purchase them in sheets of 50, I believe. And there's a card that comes with them with a color code that indicates, as the colors change, what um, the patient's level of stress or relaxation is. Great. And this is in the same realm. Um, do you know the name of the website for designing a pain monster? Sure. Um, there are actually several uh, different websites that will uh, do it, um, but the one I noted here is Kids World, and Kids is spelled with a Z. dot com. But if you also um, Google uh, creating artwork into a stuffed animal or something similar to that, you'll find other websites that do the same thing. Great. Um, 
believe this one is for Jason. Um, how are the mental health care needs of parents addressed with the palliative care uh, while the child is in the hospital? Uh, that's a <clears throat> that's a really good question. Um, you know, I, I think that number one, we have to um, remember that a lot of the mental health care needs of a parent are because of their child. So if we discuss and work with the children, whether it's in conjunction with or um, separately um, from the parents, and the parents then can see that, uh, I think that is going to contribute to uh, their psychological, you know, their overall psychological status at the time. Secondly, um, I think it's important to um, have um, the team be willing to sit down with the family and sit down with um, the parents. I mean, we are successful in, and I'm sure other programs have been successful with sibling support programs or dedicated time for the parents uh, where our psychologist or child life person can um, um, have dedicated time towards them and then referrals out because you know a lot of people are trained for pediatrics so if there's a need by a parent um, in the psychosocial uh, world or realm then um, it's, a, it's the most appropriate for us to refer them out or put them in touch with the appropriate people. Uh, this is OJ. If I could just add to that, uh, one of the things that I think we can do very well and sometimes don't do as well as we should is to teach the parents the techniques. You know, we're talking about massage therapy and the fact that you need to be licensed and so forth, and, and I agree to be a massage therapist, you do, but a simple uh, neck massage or back rub or something like that, if um, if someone could just sort of teach a parent how to do that gently in a way that will uh, make the child feel more comfortable, uh, there are lots of studies that have been done that show, that, for example, with the massage, that not only does the person receiving the massage, but the person giving the massage relax. And so you, you are helping both people by giving the parents not only that skill, but others as well, they really feel like they're able to help their child. They can't give the child medicine but they can give the child sort of psychological medicine. And I think that's very important for us to teach them how to do it. Great. Um, OJ, this question is for you kind of in conjunction to our earlier question about palliative care with infants. Um, they, this person is asking uh, how you control infection with the instruments in NICU. Do you clean instruments between each patient? And are you allowed to bring your guitar into the NICU? Okay, well, actually, that's Rosie. Rosie, do you want to talk about that? Sure. Um, let me start by saying I'm actually, I do not actually provide services in our NICU here, um, but I have talked with many music therapists who do. And similar to our inpatient protocol where I am able to go, we can definitely bring our instruments in and just making sure to follow the proper infection control protocol that um, our institution asks for. My guitar can be cavi wiped and dispatched and all the great ways that we clean things here and it, it still works and it's fine. Um, I think that was the only part of the question. Did I yeah, miss I, anything? I, I think also, Rosie, uh, in our um, uh, NICU where we're trying to get a music therapy program going, uh, they were asking for dedicated instruments that they would yes. be left there so they would not travel around the hospital, uh, but they still obviously would have to be very thoroughly clean between patients. Great. Um, we still have a few more minutes for questions. If, you, if anyone has any, please feel free to type them into uh, your chat box. Uh, we did get one more for Jason. Uh, do you consider yourself both an oncologist and a palliative care doctor? Um, that's, um, I think we're all palliative care um, providers. I really do. I, I, that's why I brought up uh, Make-A-Wish and that's why I brought up Child Life. I think we all contribute to the life care of a child with um, a life-threatening illness. That's why sometimes it's um, 
uh, challenging the whole field because I think that people misunderstand it. So they're fearful of it and they're fearful that hope will be lost or outcome will be changed. But really, day in and day out, we are palliative care uh, providers. Um, and that's all of us. That's child life. That's that's physicians, nurse practitioners. That's everyone. Um, and I think that I bring up Make a Wish earlier because that was my uh, years ago was one of my biggest you know realizations. I mean, really, Make a Wish is palliative care. And uh, um, when they started to really want to reach out or make sure people knew that it wasn't just about cancer, I think we're all part of that. So. Sure, I consider myself both that. I'm not board certified in both, but. <laughs> Great. Thank you all for your thoughtful questions. Um, I'm going to pass it on to Anne um, for next steps. Thank you, everybody. On behalf of the Child Life Council and those attending today, I would like to thank all of our presenters for sharing such great information. We appreciate you taking the time to put this web webinar together. For Child Life Specialists wish wishing to earn PDHs for today's webinar, PDHs will be earned after you have completed two steps. The first is to conduct a training session in your own workplace to share the information that you've learned here. And the second is to take a brief quiz. Later today, you will receive an email with a link to the training materials, which are based on the slides and videos that you viewed today. If you've registered as a group, your group leader will receive this email and will need to forward that link to all group members. You will use the materials that are available on that link to train your coworkers, and after you've completed the training, you will use the same link to then access the quiz, and you will submit information about the participants who attended your training session. PDHs will be earned after all these steps are completed. The deadline for completion is Friday, December 13th. If you have any questions about the requirements for earning PDHs, please email your questions to resources at childlife.org. Thank you to everyone who attended, and especially those who had attended the entire series. Thanks especially to Shelby Hammond, Dr. Kanner, and Dr. Saylor, who worked, worked so hard to bring us this webinar series. Most of all, we are grateful to Cure Search for Children's Cancer for making this webinar series possible. This ends today's webinar. <laughs>